Hello and welcome. My name is Lanny Clark. I'm the lead pastor at Our Father's House in California, Maryland. Due to the transient nature of our military community, we have ministered to hundreds and hundreds of households over the last 40 years. Our interactions with those households has revealed a glaring need, the need for greater financial intelligence among the people of God. To that end, we have used Crown Financial Materials to attempt to lay a biblical foundation for kingdom finances. We have repeatedly sponsored Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. We have hosted will clinics for our people. We even have within our context, men and women who understand investing and teach investing and how to monitor those investments. Still, from time to time, with the sudden and unexpected death of one of our people, we find a household that was not in financial order. The consequence of that lack of preparation is that the surviving spouse is often left in financial chaos and sometimes complete financial ruin. Such circumstances are part of the catalyst for the presentation that we make today. It is our objective to introduce the viewers to the wide spectrum of end-of-life considerations that heads of households and spouses need to review and implement to avert devastating consequences for the surviving spouse. We're filming this presentation in 2021. Over time, certain elements of the presentation will need to be updated to satisfy changing legal requirements or family considerations. Nonetheless, the overarching spectrum of the things we present today should become part of a family's financially intelligent action items. We submit this presentation to you in the hopes you'll take the necessary action steps to demonstrate your loving care for the ones you will leave behind. This morning, we're going to touch on legal, financial, home and property ownership, healthcare issues, and provide suggestions on how to assemble vital documentation and who should have access to those records. So you can see here, we'll, uh, we'll finish out the day with some Q&A. Uh, by the way, GYST is get your stuff together. So that's the, the acronym, acronym of the day. Some fast facts. <clears throat> According to a January 2021 survey by Princeton Survey Research Associates, uh, only 42% of adults have estate planning documents such as a will or a living trust. As we break the numbers down, they get even more uh, interesting. For those with children under age 18, 36% have an end of life plan in place. 78% of millennials don't have a will. 64% of Gen X do not have a will. 40% of respondents in the 54 to 71 year old age group do not have a will. 81% of those age 72 or older have a will or living trust in place. So um, you can see as, as, we, as we age, uh, we tend to focus a little bit more, um, but that's not necessarily uh, where we should go. Some of the top four reasons why Americans don't have a will, you can see here over half simply say, I just haven't gotten around to it. And this is, this is the, uh, the I'm going to live forever idea. Uh, it's not surprising to experts and basically they say that the, uh, the aversion to this end of life planning uh, is based not only in fear, but in procrastination. I don't have enough assets to leave to anyone. Actually, I think you'd be surprised as you go through your own situations and find out uh, you may have more than you realize. So it's uh, kind of important to take a look at. I don't know how. Um, a lot of people think it's very complicated and quite honestly, it can be complicated. And that's why it's very important to engage with some legal counsel to make sure that, uh, that this works. Uh, it's too expensive is simply not true. Uh, simple estate planning documents can be 
can be created for very reasonable costs. And so uh, it's not necessary to, uh, to worry about the expenses. Um, the more assets, uh, maybe the more children and grandchildren you have may complicate things a bit uh, and, and drive some costs. But uh, generally you can do it fairly uh, economically. <clears throat> Bottom line is we all have an expiration date and no one knows exactly when that is. The best thing you can do for your loved ones is have a will now. Proverbs itself gives us an admonition right up front. Don't boast about tomorrow for you don't know what a day might bring. So we don't think about that fragility and the temporary nature of our lives. We get caught up in day to day uh, and Quite honestly, it's, a little, it's uncomfortable. Uh, and again, we wanna put it off because it can be a lot of work. Um, the, uh, the Stephen Covey idea of the quadrants, uh, it's an important but not urgent uh, item or topic. Uh, very common for us to presume on the future. Again, we think we're gonna live till we're 80 or 90, so it's easy to just put it off. Uh, it's not fun, let's face it. Uh, it can be morose and depressing uh, and actually kind of scary when we begin to face our own mortality. Nevertheless, we have an admonition to be cautious concerning the presumption. And um, a paraphrase from Ecclesiastes gives us a couple of ideas. Moreover, when God gives us wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, that's a gift of God. But take care to reflect on the days of your life. So, um, so we want to do that. We want to be aware of the fact that um, we're still temporary uh, and there is a fragility. Now, we know that stories are a powerful way to bring understanding and clarity. So we're going to share a short story uh, of a real person. Uh, it's a friend of ours. Her name is Holly Richardson. Um, and so we'll, uh, we'll take a few minutes and let her tell uh, her experience. So welcome everybody. Uh, today we have the honor of hosting a friend of mine of almost two decades now, who is here today because her story is going to help us understand exactly where we want to take you at the end of today. Holly is a wife, a mother, a grandmother, an author, and a travel agent extraordinaire. So welcome, Holly Richardson. Thank you for Thanks, being Thanks, Mary. Here. It's good to see you. Thank you. Uh, I want to begin with, tell us what happened in your life on April 14th, 2017. Um, my husband and I had a normal evening, had dinner out on the patio, watched some TV. He went to bed. I took the dog out. By the time I got in with the dog, he was not breathing in the bedroom and um, went to the hospital, worked on him for several hours, but he very suddenly obviously passed away that evening. So no, no real health issues going on. He just suddenly died. Right. He had had some health issues four years previous, but he had completely, or so we thought, recovered from those. All right. What did you believe about the state of your estate when your husband, Scott, passed away? Well, I thought we were in pretty good shape. I paid bills, so I knew that we were current on our bills, or so I thought. Um, I believed that he had gotten enough life insurance to cover us so that if anything happened to him, I would be fine. Um, and we were planning for retirement. He had he was 68 years old and was planning on sort of ease, phasing out of his law firm um, and sort of easing into retirement at age 70 or so. Would you describe for us your journey into discovering what the actual state of your estate was? Sure. Well, as I said, four years previous, he had had a traumatic brain injury as a result of a fall. And he was in ICU for a couple of weeks. During that time, I found out that he had run up a lot of bills that I was completely unaware of. So we paid all those off and I asked him to um, 
cancel the credit cards. And at that point, we discussed getting more insurance, which he said he would do. So that's why I knew the bills had been paid off and I thought we had the insurance. Uh, the first thing that happened is he went into his law firm because one of the insurance policies was a law insurance policy that transferred from one law firm to the other when he switched um, firms. Uh, except he hadn't paid the premium on it. And so that lapsed. So that was the first indication I had that I didn't have all the insurance that I thought we had. The second policy, which was the big one, he never took out. So all we had was the one I knew of and had paperwork in my desk about. Second thing that happened is he had just gotten a brand new car um, that was leased. It was a BMW, beautiful car and got that in January, died in April, and about, he had told me that the firm was paying for that car. They were not, he was paying for that car. So the lease company said, the entire lease is now due. Right after that, the bills started coming in again, bills that I knew nothing about. So he had run up those credit cards all over again, not to the extent they were before, but there was still a substantial amount of credit card debt. He died on April 14th, taxes were due on the 18th. We got an extension in October. I went into the, the accountant and found out he had not paid taxes for a couple of years. So of the insurance policy I had over the two years I had to file jointly with him, I had to pay over half of the insurance money to IRS. Um, and again, I knew nothing about that. So would you share with us the changes that came to your life financially and emotionally as a result? Of course, there would be grief and loss with your husband, but I'm referring especially now to the results of the state that your estate was in. Okay. Uh, well, the first thing, and I think one of the hardest things for me was that I knew I was going to have to sell our house. And every expert will tell you that you shouldn't make such a large move for the first year after you've lost a spouse. I had to do it within 60 days. So the house went on the market in June. And before that, I had to have an auction to clear out 45 years worth of belongings. And that was devastating. That was emotionally devastating to see everything we owned on tables, um, wedding presents and you know things that had that maybe didn't have a lot of monetary value but meant something emotionally to me but that I couldn't keep and so that was very difficult house went on the market in June I sold it in October um, that whole process was pretty devastating um, a year later I had to sell our cabin which we had up in northern Arizona and I loved that place I think that was harder to sell even than the house was um, Emotionally, it was very difficult for me because my kids, um, both of whom lived here at the time, adored their father. But as a result, they were unable to be there emotionally for me because they could not discuss his shortcomings with me. They just didn't want to go there. All of that coupled then with the idea of the betrayal because we'd been married just too much short of 45 years. And I don't know if he changed, if that was always part of his makeup to hide things. Um, but it was like, how does, how does somebody that loves you do this to you? And so then it was, well, did he ever really love me or was it all about him? And so then you have feelings of resentment and then that builds into feelings of uh, less self-worth and, if he didn't care about me, why? Why am I not lovable? Or why didn't he want to share with me as a spouse should? And so that brings you into a downward spiral along with all the financial things you're dealing with. And I will admit, although I don't like to, that I did have suicidal thoughts about a year into this um, because the pressure was just so incredibly great. I didn't know what I was gonna do with the rest of my life. And I had, a one person in particular that pulled me out of it and I will be forever grateful, but it, it's a very, it's, it's a combination of the finances that you're not aware of and that you have to deal with when you're grieving plus the, well, why? And I'll never know the answer to that. Yeah. yeah. What has it taken to get your feet back on the ground to create the life you're living now? Well, the first thing I did 
And well, it wasn't the first thing I did. I wallowed in self-pity for a while. <laughs> and I did try some grief counseling one-on-one -on -one, and that just didn't work for me. And I know everybody's different. Some people might thrive with that. I did not. I did find a group um, through our hospice um, a group here that was very helpful. And I did feel like I wasn't alone, that I wasn't the only one going through this, although their situations were different. Um, I do believe that when you're widowed, nobody can really understand you except somebody that's been there, no matter what the circumstances are. Um, people can try and be sympathetic, but only somebody that's in your shoes really knows what you're dealing with. I knew I had to go back to work. And I was 68 when Scott died, and that's not a time you think about going back to work. All my friends were retiring. I was very, very resentful. But I've been in the travel business for over 35, 38 years, so I knew that. And I used some of the insurance money, which was a small amount left, as a gamble, bought a franchise. And that has turned into a lifesaver because it gave me my self-esteem back. It gave me a sense of purpose. Um, it gave me an income, uh, gave me the ability to still travel, which was one of the things I loved the most, um, except this year. And um, I'm very grateful that I had that to do. If I hadn't had that to do, I would have had to have gotten a job anyway. It might not have fulfilled me as much, but it still would have given me a sense of purpose. And I think that was very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, everybody should find someone that they can tell everything to mm -hmm. um, and, and just feel comfortable with. I realized it wasn't my kids. And when I was able to let that go and let somebody else into my life that could help me that way, that helped a great deal. Yes, yes. Well... What are the three most important things that you have done to prepare your estate for your loved ones? I found a website called beremembered.com. And on there, you can plan your own funeral. And, you know, what you want to have, whether it's verses, songs, um, birds singing, what you want and what you don't want. And I found that very helpful to put things in because I had none of that direction from Scott. He didn't think he was gonna die that night. And so I had to plan his funeral, not knowing what his wishes were. Um, they were pretty much my wishes, but uh, that was difficult. And it was emotionally hard because I didn't know if it, what I did would be something he'd like. So I took that burden away from my kids. Okay. Um, I don't have any bills except my mortgage. I paid everything off and when I die, they can sell the house if I haven't already sold it and they don't have to worry stress-wise about anything else. That was number two. And I guess I would say there is, I have an app on my phone where I have all my passwords, all my information, the health insurance, the life insurance, everything I've got, and I have the password to that app in an envelope in my desk drawer, and both of my kids know it's there. Mm -hmm. And so they can go into that drawer, open the envelope, and they will have access to everything, <laughs> the bank accounts, everything. Yes. And that will solve a lot of problems. And you have a will and powers of attorney and advanced directives. Correct. All, all of that is in place. Right. Yes. And that's all in that envelope as yeah. to where to find that. Yes. Wow. Holly, thank you so much for your vulnerability today. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing your story. I know that it will bless everyone who hears it. And um, we, we pray that all these things for you just keep going in the right direction and that you find well-deserved happiness. Thanks, Mary. This is a wonderful service you're doing. I, I hope it helps some people because it's a shock. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thanks Mary. Bye. Bye. So this is Holly's story, um, and unfortunately, it is not necessarily unique. It can be very common. 
uh, and we are just so grateful that Holly was so willing to, to share this with us. So now we'll be moving on. And we're gonna pick up and begin discussing legal documentation. There are four areas we're gonna consider this morning. The first is gonna be wills and trusts. These documents simply direct the disposition of assets, not only after your death, but you can also use those while you're still living. And again, you don't have to spend a lot, amount, a lot on a lawyer. LegalZoom.com is one of the sites you can go to to get started. Um, and if you're not comfortable with finishing it there, then you can uh, contact a, a lawyer to help with that. We're gonna talk about the financial power of attorney. Uh, this is sim simply a document that names someone you trust to handle money matters if you're incapacitated, but actually not only if you're incapacitated. For example, when, uh, when Mary and I moved to Maryland, uh, we had not yet closed on our house. And the date for the closing came up and I had to be out of town on business travel. Mary was able through the power of attorney that she had to sign my name 37,000 times as the, uh, the attorney in fact in my name. So the power of attorney helped greatly in, in that situation. Of course, now a lot of this is happening uh, virtually uh, these days. So it might be a little bit different but the power of attorney is really important. We're gonna talk about advanced healthcare directives. Tim is gonna be talking about that in some detail. Uh, this is basically how to handle uh, the end of life conditions. Uh, if you find yourself or if the family finds you in a situation where you have a number of different conditions that would um, need to be addressed at that time. The survivor's guide, letters of instruction, and what we call the dead list, uh, they're not necessarily legal documents, but they definitely communicate very, very well to your loved ones in particular um, about what you wish, what you want. So for example, the survivor's guide is something that, um, that the church uh, generates and that uh, deals with the, the immediate actions that should be taken. Uh, in the event that uh, one or more uh, spouses or family members were to pass. Letters of instruction are a, a bit more uh, informal. For example, uh, we have one that uh, lists all of our accounts, when they're due, how they are paid, whether they're on auto pay or uh, if they have to be managed uh, manually. Um, also, uh, everything concerning my employment and uh, what would have to be um, dealt with uh, in that. So letters of instruction and that kind of thing, including things such as uh, how I want my funeral to be um, addressed. The dead list, as we call it, is a, um, is a document that is simply uh, a, a collection of uh, important uh, items. Usually it's uh, an antique or a piece of jewelry or some uh, some uh, sentimental uh, item, but may still have some monetary value. And that then identifies which family member might receive, you know, grandpa's pocket watch uh, or the coin collection or whatever. And so uh, that dead list happens. Um, uh, it, it is created so that family members will know um, how to, um, how to disperse on those. And so we can talk about that a little bit. So let's talk about wills. Very simply put, a will is a written document that directs the disposition of a person's assets um, after death. Um, it's very important to, uh, to do the planning. Uh, in fact, I had a conversation recently with the St. Mary's County Register of Wills. Um, there are some key items, ideas about uh, why we would do that. Uh, first of all, it appoints the trusted fiduciaries or personal representatives, trustees and guardians in the case of uh, children or grandchildren. Uh, it allows you to achieve maximum savings of administrative costs and death taxes. Tim will probably address the issue of probate in a little bit as well, um, but uh, administrative costs can be reduced by having a will. Uh, wills also dispose of your estate according to your wishes and it definitely avoids 
possible family disputes. Um, also, there's a, uh, there's a service that St. Mary's County Register of Wills offers uh, where you can actually register your will with them. They take the will and they store it in fire, fireproof safes in the county that adds an additional layer of safety. And um, it's very important because once someone dies, even if you have a will and you have it registered, you have to go to the register of wills and then uh, go through the process of obtaining letters of administration for the estate as an executor. If the will is already registered and it's there, it's a much simpler process to do that. Uh, in Maryland, um, wills have to be signed by the person making the will uh, and attested to and signed by two credible witnesses. Um, so there are certain things. Why should I make a will? Because it is the most important of all legal documents. This would be the first priority is to make that, uh, make that a priority and get it done. Uh, married couples should, uh, should both have separate wills. Why? Because if you don't have both parents covered by individual wills, it can complicate matters, especially for couples with children. For example, in Maryland, if a parent dies without a will, then Maryland law determines who will inherit his or her property because that parent will have died intestate. So if one of you has a will and one of you doesn't, it can complicate things very much. Also, you want to avoid having what's called a joint will because if you write a joint will and one of you dies, the joint will becomes invalid because it, it, it ends up being locked. Uh, and that's something you want to avoid. So each spouse should have separate wills. A trust is a, simply a legal arrangement uh, where one person gives legal ownership of property to a second person known as the trustee. Uh, they can be used for all kinds of reasons um, and they, are, they come in a, a variety of flavors. Um, often that is um, a way to bring property into say an existing trust or establish a trust for minor children in the event of um, uh, a, a parent's death so that the, uh, the children will have some uh, future um, in terms of the resources. There are a couple of acts in Maryland that, uh, that govern uh, how trusts are handled in the state. Uh, and they're really flexible. Uh, you can set them up for ch charitable purposes. Uh, you know, I wanna go, I wanna have a certain trust set up for uh, this ministry or that. And uh, they can also be set up as revocable or irrevocable. The financial power of attorney authorizes someone else to handle certain matters such as finances or healthcare on your behalf. And I, I shared a little bit about what happened with the closing on our house when we moved to Maryland. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing to have in place. Uh, also, we have powers of attorney on individual accounts. Uh, if you have any individual bank accounts, savings accounts or whatever, if you establish a power of attorney that allows you to um, conduct business uh, in, that, uh, in that particular case. A durable power of attorney uh, helps you plan for medical emergencies uh, in case you have a decline in your mental functioning uh, and that can uh, make sure that uh, your finances are gonna be taken care of. In Maryland, a written power of attorney is assumed to be durable and a durable power of attorney doesn't end when the principal becomes disabled. That's, that's the key feature. Uh, of a durable power of attorney. You should definitely um, have a lawyer prepare uh, a POA. The medical power of attorney, also known as an advanced healthcare directive or a healthcare power of attorney, uh, it is um, a document that names one person as the healthcare agent of another person. The agent has the authority <clears throat> to make healthcare decisions and the responsibility to make sure doctors and other medical personnel provide necessary and appropriate care 
according to the patient's wishes. Without a medical power of attorney, my, it's my understanding that um, physicians can make those kinds of decisions um, without the uh, consent or the authority of, uh, of family members. I don't know that to be the case. That would be something to verify uh, once one of those is being established um, through, through the appropriate legal counsel. Uh, anyone who's considered competent, I suppose, as uh, being of sound mind and body uh, is what uh, constitutes um, competency. Uh, and you can, you can set those up um, so anyone can really do that. Uh, there is also an act, the Maryland Healthcare Decision Act, uh, governs advanced directives. So now I believe it's uh, Tim's turn to take the... Uh, Take the floor. Hello, I'm Tim Frank, the church administrator at our father's house. I want to tell you a story about Chanel Reynolds and Jose. They lived out in Seattle. They were two professional, very well-educated millennials. They had high paying jobs. They had two kids, a nice house and a big house payment. They had school loans and credit card debt, like many do. They had some money in an IRA, but not much because they hadn't been professionals for very long. And they had very little money in savings. Everything seemed great until Jose was struck by a van and he died in critical care a week later. After the accident, Chanel realized she was completely unprepared for Jose's death. She discovered that passwords were missing. She couldn't get into his phone or his computer. His will, unfortunately, had not been signed. It had been taken out uh, earlier, several months before, but not signed. The life insurance was too little and she discovered she was probably gonna lose the new house. It took her over three years to untangle the financial mess that had to go through probate because she didn't have a will. He didn't have a will. She then chronicled her experiences on a website. And when that website went viral and touched the lives of so many people, she ended up starting a business to help folks and wrote a book to help others. Her book, What Matters Most, The Guide to Wills, Money, Insurance, and Life's What Ifs, is a very informative book with tremendous resources on everything you could imagine in preparing for end of life issues. A word of warning, it is a raw look at end of life issues. It's filled with hard emotions and some very hard language, uh, but she just told it like it is and she had a powerful story to tell, much like Holly. So I wanna share some things you really need to have in place in order to prepare your loved ones um, financially for the end of your life. First, you've gotta have a survivor's guide with clear detailed instructions concerning your finances. You need to make sure that several people know your password to your phone and your computer and where you store all your important passwords. I thought I was prepared, but then I, realized as I was gathering these materials together, I hadn't told anybody the passwords to my computer or my phone. So even though I have a, a special file with everything and programs, they were inaccessible. You got to know how much money you have so that you can tell it where to go and so that your spouse knows where it's at. You should establish a system to track your finances so your spouse knows your financial health, I've been using Quicken for over 20 years. It's a great program. Something I do every year is to prepare a net worth statement for all of my assets. That would clearly show my spouse all that I have, all that we have. You should prepare a complete list with all of the account numbers of your financial accounts, your checking accounts, your savings accounts, money market accounts. If you have precious metals, you got to uh, identify how much you have and where they are stored. If you've got it buried under that oak tree in the backyard, you got to leave somebody a treasure map or there are going to be some pretty uh, disappointed uh, family members. 
And also, like Pastor Lanny had shared, I highly recommend Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University or Crown Financial to get your financial house in order. Hopefully you have retirement resources that you've been saving up for the end of your days. Again, we need to prepare detailed instructions with the names of those uh, resources, the account numbers, and the values for all your accounts. If you have IRAs, 401ks, or 403b accounts, you must designate the beneficiaries on those documents. If you have these accounts without beneficiaries, you uh, will create great difficulties for your uh, loved ones. Without beneficiaries, the accounts roll over directly into probate. Even though you may have a will, the problem is those assets are being held in your name only. And so they have to go through probate, which is a legal process, which takes time. It takes months and months and months. It's a public process and it costs money. There's probate fees and there's attorney's fees. If you haven't detailed beneficiaries, since the IRA benefits are poured into the estate and not directly handed over to your loved one, they now require a five-year payout. So let's say you were very faithful over many years and accumulated a million dollars in your uh, 403B or your 401k account. The state would require that those funds be paid out over a five-year process so that every year you'd get $200,000. You would have to pay federal income taxes and state income taxes on that $200,000. So they're gonna get a large chunk of money and it's gonna push you into a higher tax bracket. You don't want that to happen. Please make your beneficiaries clearly designated to the loved ones you wanna give your money to. Also, uh, detail whatever pension funds you might have. Make sure your loved one knows how much is coming. And if you have a trust, what those values are. <clears throat> Social Security has benefits for people who lose loved ones when they're younger before retirement. And it has benefits uh, if you lose a loved one after retirement. But one thing I learned the hard way, when your spouse dies, you only receive one benefit, either yours or your spouse's, whichever is higher. So if you were depending upon two people to find your retirement, to have a flow of cash, and one of them passes away, you no longer have that. There are rules for two earner households. It differ according to your age and your earnings history. Again, go to the SSA website for details. If you're young and you are a widow with children, there are survivor benefits available for widows with children. And the government will give you a very small death benefit of $255, which uh, can pay maybe 1 50th to 1 20th of all of your funeral expenses. It's very small compared to what you have to pay for funeral expenses. Debt, uh, you heard Holly's story. Uh, there are many spouses do not realize the debt their spouses have run up behind their back. Holly was shocked and devastated by her husband's debts and the burden it put upon her to pay those off. Please list all of your outstanding debts, balances, and account numbers. Any credit cards you might have, what are they and how much do you owe? If you have uh, any uh, home or auto, like that lease Holly had, that was a shock to her. Any lines of credit you might have, personal lines of uh, credit, and of course, student loans if you're younger, and personal loans. And a few people have had to take uh, loans against their 401k. Those have to be paid back if you pass away. Jose had a life insurance policy, but it wasn't nearly what Chanel needed, just like Holly. Now, a good rule of thumb to estimate how much you need is 10 times your salary, plus enough to pay off all your debts and set aside money for the kids' college education. 
You should list the policies, the amount and type. Make sure the beneficiaries are named and backup beneficiaries if your spouse should pass away. Purchase your insurance carefully. Accidental death insurance does not pay for a sudden death like a heart attack or a stroke. It may be a lower premium, but it is not a good deal. The best value in, that you can get for life insurance is a term policy. I highly recommend spacing it out so that age 50, you can get a 20 year policy that'll cover you until you retire at age 70. And that will have a very affordable premium. How much do you need? Again, it all depends on your age, your assets, and who needs your help. In general, the more assets you have, the less insurance you need to have. So that by the time you hit age 70, you don't need a million dollar policy that would be incredibly expensive. You know, it, it could cost $10,000 a year for a very large policy at age 70. But if you already have substantial assets, you don't need that life insurance anymore. Keith is gonna talk about home and property. Okay. Um, also, I just wanted to mention the thing on the uh, on the the life insurance. The older you get, the more expensive it is. Uh, I had a I had a much smaller policy than Tim was talking about, and um, I I bought it. I was I guess twenty years or so, and then the expiration came, and I was offered to continue that policy for the next several years, and it was eighteen thousand dollars a year. Um, and so I said, mm, no, thanks. I don't think I need that. So regarding home and property, um, again, now we need to list our real estate vehicles and other properties we own, rent or lease, and include the documents, deeds and titles and loans and lease agreements and anything that is, um, that is outstanding regarding your home and property. Um, Make sure that uh, if you can, my understanding is if you hold your property in common, then that property avoids probate because if one spouse dies, it carries over to the surviving spouse without having to pass through the probate process. And that would simplify things a great deal. Uh, go through the inside and outside of your house. Do the inventory. Make a list of all the valuable items, kind of like we talked about uh, all the way down to the dead list. You know, grandpa's watch and, and uh, wedding rings, great-grandmother's wedding rings and that kind of thing, art and antiques, collectibles, even your lawn equipment, your power tools. You know, a lot of us guys have, have, have got some great tools. And so we wanna make sure that, that we've inventoried those. So take a running video, that's a great way to do it. Um, I actually had someone, uh, an insurance agent uh, urge me to do that is just walk through your house, take a video of everything that is there. Um, so you have a document, um, it's actually documented through, the, through that video. Uh, the survivor's guide, I talked about it uh, earlier. Um, this is something that basically uh, deals with the immediate actions that need to be taken. Um, when something like that happens, particularly if it's sudden, uh, people who are in the, in the throes of the trauma of that experience need some guidance, some help. Uh, and so it's not just a written document, it's also uh, very helpful to have someone come alongside and assist with that. Uh, that's something that, uh, that we, uh, we have in place at our father's house. We certainly uh, have guidance on how to, uh, how to process that and how to be ready for uh, communicating that information. The letters of instruction, again, that's the financial information that we discussed a little bit earlier. All the accounts, all the account numbers, maybe passwords in that same, uh, same area, but um, uh, you know, what your bills are, how they get paid, to whom uh, they get paid and so on uh, is, is very helpful. And, um, and then again, uh, what I want for my funeral, kind of like uh, beremembered.com that Holly uh, recommended. Uh, the dead list again, let's talk about uh, 
wedding rings and watches and guitars. Hey, guitars for the musicians, uh, drum sets and, and all kinds of things like that. Um, set off, set, uh, set the dead list up so um, you can go to the next level of detail. And that really, that kind of wraps things up a bit for, um, for the home and property. There's a lot there in terms of particularly getting the, uh, the inventory together and, uh, and making sure that uh, everyone that would need to know does know uh, what's in place for you. So back over to Tim for, uh, to address healthcare. Okay. Uh, healthcare and insurance. Keith Hall has already talked about the importance of a advanced healthcare directive, also known as a living will. Remember, this document spells out your wishes regarding your end of life medical treatment when you can no longer make decisions for yourself. I have a copy of my living will here in front of me. The living will comes into place when either A, you are uh, determined by two doctors to have a, uh, that you're unconscious and you're not gonna come out of consciousness, or uh, in the written opinion of your attending physician, you have an incurable disease, illness, or some condition which will result in your soon passing away. Um, and if the use of life prolonging treatment would serve only to artificially prolong the process of dying. And so there was a bunch of items that I could choose what I wanted to be done or not done. And so I checked all the boxes, no cardiopulmonary resuscitation, no tube feeding, no artificial hydration, no surgery or invasive procedures, no dialysis, chemotherapy, radiation, et cetera. You need to have a document like that in place. Some people want to be kept alive as long as possible. Others don't want to prolong their own suffering or the suffering of their loved ones. I have this legal will, but in the process of working these materials, I just realized that I need to discuss this document with my children. They don't know what's in my living will. Now, Jose was in critical condition for a week before he died. He had never signed a living will. So Chanel had to negotiate his end of life wishes with his doctors. Jose also did not have the signed health care power of attorney giving Chanel the legal power to make his healthcare decisions. Again, she had to negotiate everything with the doctors. My power of attorney, which I have here in front of me, um, it has a section that specifically says, in reference to the living will, I specifically direct my agent to follow my healthcare declaration executed by me. So it, it refers to this living will document to detail all of my end of life care that I have chosen. Jose also did not have disability insurance, which was for a while there, incredibly upsetting to Chanel. Uh, he had uh, suffered catastrophic spinal injury and she was very fearful that, oh my goodness, he might be paralyzed for life. How am I gonna take care of him? How can I work and take care of someone who's paralyzed? Did we have disability? only to discover that he'd never taken the disability that his company had offered because it was extra money and he decided he didn't need it. He was a bicyclist, he was in great shape. He was never gonna need disability. Yet one in four people will become disabled during their working career for a variety of reasons. Please, if you have, can, I recommend getting disability insurance. Um, Another very important type of insurance that we can get as we're approaching older years is long-term care insurance. It only pays a benefit to people who need home health care, nursing home, or another form of covered long-term care assistance. The average nursing home costs over $100,000 per year per person in Maryland. That's a tremendous amount of money. And some studies report that over 65% of us will require some long-term care at the end of our life. Uh, my doctor a while back told me that the average 90-year-old, 50% of those people who reach 90 will have some form of dementia. And uh, I am 
personally aware that people in nursing homes, the majority of people in nursing homes have some form of dementia. So the question to ask, A, do you have family that can take care of you if you have Alzheimer's? Uh, or do you have assets to pay for their care? My father um, was faced with my mother coming down with Alzheimer's because of difficulties she was showing with her memory. And he purchased a long-term care policy on her and it was extremely valuable as she neared the end of her days, sure enough, having come down with Alzheimer's. Policies are not as expensive as you think they may be, but the longer you rate, the more expensive the policy will become. Let's talk about uh, Medicare and Medicaid. At age 65, most everyone transitions to Medicare. If retired, your Part B premiums will be deducted directly from your Social Security check. And you may not realize this, Part A is solely hospitalization, paid 80-20. Part B is Medicare paying some of your doctor's bills. But again, only at an 80-20 rate. You still need supplemental insurance and a prescription plan in order to cover the majority of all the other expenses that you may have. At age 65, I just transitioned to Medicare. I am paying about $350 a month for my health care. Those are my Part B premiums, my supplemental plan G premiums, and my prescription health care. Medicaid is only for people with very limited income and no assets over $2,500. So if you were thinking, oh, I don't need long-term care insurance, I'm just going to get Medicaid when I grow old and I don't have anybody to take care of me, but you have to spend out all of your assets before you could qualify for Medicaid, and then you could only do it if you have limited income. The government will not cover your medical bills or nursing home care until all your assets are essentially gone. And military personnel have TRICARE for their insurance. End of life care. We need to talk to our loved ones, our spouses and our children about our advanced healthcare plans. There's a multitude of subjects which need to be discussed. The Kunif Dixon Foundation was established to enrich the physician patient relationship near the end of life. Um, he had had, uh, his wife had terminal cancer. They had many discussions before she passed away and he decided he wanted to help others have those same discussions before they lose their loved ones. There's a website which we are providing on our resource sheet, uh, which will be provided to everybody who attended this seminar. It'll be posted on our website. So you will have access to all of these web links and a variety of uh, articles and papers that we've prepared for your benefit. Funeral considerations, you may not realize this, but even a very simple funeral with cremation will still cost you over $5,000. And if you want a burial, it will cost you thousands of dollars more depending upon all sorts of factors. Like you can get a $20,000 casket if you want, or you can get a box from Walmart if you wish. There's all sorts of options from the least expensive to very expensive. Okay, so there's a checklist of all kinds of key actions that we can take to uh, make sure that we're loving and protecting our loved ones. So um, just go through the list. Create or update your legal documents, your will, powers of attorney, trust, advanced directives, any of those documents that need to be taken care of. Get your finances in order. Assets, debts, cash flow, retirement accounts, insurance, and so forth. Um, another pitch for financial peace that uh, Dave Ramsey gives some, some excellent starting points with that. Make sure you itemize your inventory, all the home and property, uh, all the way down to, uh, to again, grandpa's watch. Uh, make sure that you keep on top of your healthcare coverages because things change as we age. Um, you know, we, we 
we tend to also cross certain age boundaries that um, that statistics show uh, changes in uh, the need for health care coverage. Make sure you, you write or get a survivor's guide, some kind of guideline to help anyone. Um, write your letters of instruction um, and then uh, create a dead list. Make sure that you remember getting the passwords communicated uh, beyond just yourself. Um, I think that uh, Tim would acknowledge he has, a, uh, he has an acquaintance who is very, um, very well versed in, in the cyber world. And uh, he's got a bit of a caution about using on, uh, online cloud-based um, websites and so forth to, um, to place such documentation uh, on. So a, a bit of caution might be uh, in order there. Uh, again, uh, use the GIST resources and the websites. As Tim said, we're going to make all those uh, resources available uh, as well as this, this presentation. But um, take things one step at a time. Um, this is an awful lot of things that can, um, can consume our time and our concerns, particularly if we are at a place where we're starting um, from scratch or at ground zero. So it takes a bit of time. Hey, um, one other thing I would like to offer our people if they want to stick around and give a little bit more information. Um, one of my dear friends in church, and she's now just started to become the, she's going to be our new church uh, secretary, Penny Dennis. Her husband, Craig, died suddenly over 20 years ago at age, I believe, 33. And she experienced a lot of uh, challenges and difficulties, not as severe as Holly's story. And... Um, Chanel Reynolds story, but uh, Penny is participating on this and she's willing to briefly share her experience and the five things she learned and wish she had in place or was thankful for. So if we don't have any other questions, if Penny, if you are still with us and would like to share, um, you can, Jessica can turn your video on and you're more than welcome to share with us since we have some extra time. Or good morning. Not a, ah, is Penny still there? Hi. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Penny. Yeah, there you are. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know you, like Tim said, I'm Penny Dennis, and uh, my husband Craig died uh, very suddenly and unexpectedly back in 1999. Uh, we had just been on vacation. Uh, we had a wonderful time in New Mexico. We went with friends to visit other friends out there had a fabulous time. We returned home thinking everything's fine. That morning after we returned home, I woke up to Craig in distress. He appeared to be having a seizure and he died that morning. Um, so evidently, you know, obviously um, having just been on vacation, this was not anything that I'd ever expected to happen to me. Uh, we were living our regular lives, enjoying ourselves on vacation, returning to what we thought would be our, our regular daily routines. I was completely devastated. Um, he was only 35 and it was a week before my 33rd birthday. Um, so I just want to encourage people to don't think that something like this cannot happen to you. Uh, and don't think that you've got decades, um, years to make these important life decisions. Um, Craig and I at the time were what we call dinks, which is double income, no kids. Um, and so we just never thought about end of life uh, decisions. Um, we were enjoying our lives and looking forward to growing old together. And that's what we thought would happen. Um, so when Craig died, again, I was utterly devastated, overwhelmed. I could not think, much less make decisions, but the request for decisions kept coming at me. So some of the decisions more on the emotional end that you, you would have to face at that point is immediately at the hospital, I was asked about organ donation. I had never talked about organ donation with Craig. So I didn't know what his feelings were about that. Um, they wanted to have an autopsy and I didn't like the idea of that. And they said I had no choice in that. Um, and that was because he was healthy and they didn't know why he had died. Um, I would like to say in the end that ended up being good for me because I found out what the reason of his death was, which was called deep vein thrombosis. Um, he had a blood clot that went to his lungs and 
caused him not to have oxygen to his body. Um, but you're asked, where will he be buried? You know, I, we lived here in Southern Maryland, but none of our family was here. So, you know, am I gonna bury him here or bury him back home where everybody's at? Um, where would the funeral be held? I wanted to accommodate my family back home and my friends and his coworkers up here. Um, what music do you want at the funeral? What clothes are you gonna be buried in? They're just asking you all these questions. And I also couldn't believe all the money involved. Um, when making the funeral arrangements, I felt like my husband has just died and you're nickel and diming me to death with fees for everything. There was a charge for the casket. Um, I remember walking around in the room with all the caskets and thinking, you know, I was so emotional. I felt like I had to get him the best casket to honor him when in reality, that was not the case. The most expensive did not need to be bought, but when you're in this emotional state, it's hard to get around that. Um, there was a charge for the vault, a charge for the liner to the vault, a charge to dig the hole, to fill the hole for the marker, to install the marker. So I was just very much in disbelief and distraught at being charged for every little aspect of the arrangements. And in this, I just don't want you to misunderstand my point. The um, funeral homes and cemeteries, they are a business and they must charge for their services. The people were actually very kind to me and compassionate, but when you're in the midst of such great loss, um, those are really harsh realities to face. Um, I was very numb and it was difficult to make those decisions. And I, because I didn't wanna do anything that would disservice Craig, I wanted to honor him. And um, I wanted to make decisions and choices that he would have chosen for himself, but I ultimately didn't know what he would have chosen because we never discussed it. So my, my encouragement to everyone is don't leave your loved ones with the burden of figuring out details and making decisions in the midst of their emotional trauma and devastation. Please talk to one another about these things now while you have the ability to think clearly. Uh, I know we don't like to think about the eventual death of our loved ones, but one day, one of you will be faced with the situation and it will be much easier on the survivor if you already have a plan in place. I, want, uh, I would consider it an act of love to talk about about these things together and to make decisions together about your end of life preferences. Um, so that's my major encouragement to everyone is to get your finances in order. Um, we actually had debt. We had gone through the Larry Burkett thing on getting out of debt and we have been working on that. But when Craig died, um, I, uh, you know, we ac accumulated credit card debt. So it was very more than humbling. It was embarrassing you know, to, to reveal to your family and to those who are helping you financially what kind of debt you're in. And so it was difficult to reveal that to people. Um, and you need to plan your finances so that your loved ones um, will not lose their house when you, when, um, you die. Um, and Craig and I, again, we were young. We both just got our jobs. We, we signed the paperwork as new hires, but we, I don't think we really understood it all. So again, uh, the, the last thing I would say, other than considering this an act of love to prepare in advance for your loved ones, get your finances together so that that's taken care of, but educate yourselves and make financial plans now. And please don't let it be one-sided. You both need to know what's going on in your finances and how the funeral arrangements, your house and basic bills would be paid should your loved one ever die. It would make it so much more easier on them. Wow, wow, thank you so much. So um, just one other point that, uh, that may be underneath that that I noticed is um, there's a difference between pre-planning and pre-paying a funeral. And um, in, um, Taking, taking the uh, influence from Dave Ramsey, uh, he is not in favor of prepaying, but absolutely for pre-planning so that uh, any money that you would have spent that would be considered a sunk cost into a prepaid funeral could be invested in the meantime, because again, we don't know uh, what our expiration date is. Um, and so um, the best thing to do is to put that, uh, those funds that would be used for that uh, to good use in the meantime. So thank you so much, Penny, I appreciate that. With that, we've come to a, uh, a point where uh, 
we're at the q a there's just a couple of things we want to uh, go through we do plan to have some future presentations on specific topics uh, we're in preliminary discussions with a lawyer right now to uh, to expand on the uh, the legal documentation issue um, again links to the resources are going to be available on the church website uh, and that's going to be our new website uh, www.ofhsomd.com and that's going to launch on monday so with that i'll pass it over to jessica and uh, see if there are any questions that um, bear some responses there are thank you so one of the first questions that i have is what are some suggestions for single or older people to make possible long-term care plans if they're unable to live independently and there aren't immediate family members who can provide care? What does that look like for them? Oh, that's over to Tim. <laughs> well, let me unmute him before he starts sharing. Okay. <laughs> well, I would get in touch with an insurance agent, particularly one who's a broker who represents a multiple number of companies and just ask them what sort of policies uh, are available. Um, there are um, two different types that you can have long-term care insurance and you can also have short-term care insurance. The short-term care insurance policies are much less expensive, but one of the big benefits to a long-term care gotten when you were younger that I did not remember to bring up uh, is that they are very cautious in who they will insure. Uh, they don't insure people who have serious life-threatening illnesses uh, like um, uh, diabetes, uh, emphysema, uh, current heart disease, et cetera. Um, so the younger you are, the less likely you will have serious end-of-life issues uh, or diseases which could end your life early. And so you could get... Um, the insurance a whole lot more successfully. Uh, Short-term uh, insurance policies for care are a lot less expensive. And from what I understand, they don't have the same uh, uh, very high bar for health conditions. I think one other thing I might in interject here is uh, in terms of a single individual, um, it's really important that you have some connections with friends, uh, intimate, uh, intimate friends, if you will, who, um, who can um, to watch out for your welfare so that you don't feel isolated or alone or don't have family members that you can rely on. So being connected is a very important aspect to that. The next question I received was, it's my understanding that one can draw on their deceased loved one's social security early and then switch over to their own social security when he or she reaches the age to receive those full benefits. Um, can anybody speak to whether that's accurate here in the state of Maryland? No, I really can't. Uh, I would definitely either call social security or look on their website uh, that's one of those things that are a little tricky. And there's a uh, there's a gentleman named Robert Carlson who's written a book called The New Rules of Retirement, and he addresses Social Security prior to well, right at the threshold of the Affordable Care Act uh, enactment, and um, he talks in great detail about survivors' benefits and switching over and that kind of thing. He has a website, um, and uh, he, he would be a, a good resource before going to Social Security. Um, the, other, uh, the other resource is last week I attended a webinar uh, from an investment firm up in the D.C. area, and they addressed Social Security, and the, the gentleman who presented, whose name uh, escapes me at the moment, um, he did... Um, suggests that we take any counsel we receive from Social Security office with a bit of a grain of salt because sometimes the answers we receive are inconsistent from uh, individual to individual. 
Um, and so it's really important to, um, to get a multitude of counselors to, uh, to address those issues. Keith, what was the name of that book again? The New Rules of Retirement by Robert Carlson. And I've, I've actually interacted with him on a couple in planning for, for uh, our Social Security transition. And uh, his answers are prompt and excellent. The next question I received was, if a person doesn't have anyone in their life that they would trust with their passwords and the location of those hidden assets, what are their options? Can they leave those on file with their lawyer? Should they secure a safety deposit box? And in that same vein, what are some suggestions on how they would distribute their estate? Well, first, um, they should have all those legal documents registered with the court. Um, uh, register so that those documents are all together. They can put basic passwords in there. Of course, passwords by their very nature are encouraged to be changed periodically. Um, you can update your legal documents. You just give them $5 and, and they'll give you your old one and they'll register your new one. Um, if you've got a lawyer, certainly you can give your lawyer uh, those uh, that information. But I would say if somebody's in that position, you need to get a friend. <laughs> you need somebody you can trust. Just like Keith said, oh, I would hate to go through uh, the end of my days and not have somebody who can help me. If you're not in a church, find a church. Uh, if you need a friend, I'll be your friend. Come talk to me. Nobody should be isolated as they're facing the end of their life. And I don't want your passwords. <laughs> Are there any recommended companies for the purchase of those disability and long-term care insurance policies that you've been referencing? No, we can't uh, make any recommendations like that. But as I say, um, there are brokers who represent a multitude of companies. Uh, you can talk to me offline and I'll tell you a broker I've been using at the church to provide uh, uh, stuff for us. Uh, but it's, I really can't recommend anybody because there are so many companies out there. And for me to recommend one would be right. disrespecting everybody else. You can also do the Google for all kinds of resources and you'll get, you know, two or three million hits. And one of the last questions I received was everyone here is trying to get their own things in order. What are some suggestions you can make in terms of approaching their parents? or their spouses or their siblings to have these discussions. Because as you noted, they are emotional and they can be a bit morbid. How can our folks love their people well and have these conversations? Well, I have a suggestion. I think you can use this video we just have um, recorded. Um, we'll have a very uh, good cover letter explaining the value of doing this. I took uh, essentially a, a dry run of this video with my siblings. Uh, the, six, the seven of us got together last weekend and we had a really good discussion on these things. Several of us were like, golly, I don't have that. And I'm not sure about that. Um, so, and, and I also talked to several of my kids and said, hey, guess what? Dad's doing this and you need to watch this. And we need to sit down and talk about this because I've never done this before with you. You don't know what my living will is and you don't know where my passwords are. Um, by the way, I did give Keith my, my uh end of life checklist. So Keith Wallace knows where my stuff is. If I'm gone, you can ask Keith where I got my gold buried. Uh, so uh, <laughs> at any rate, um, use this video to encourage and instruct uh, your family to make these sort of decisions. Oh, and by the way, um, Dave Rams in dealing with the um, with the talk with mom and dad, Dave Ramsey called that the, the challenge of the powdered butt syndrome, because once your parents have raised you and powdered your behind, having the talk with them can be very difficult. Um, and it can also be exacerbated if you have a lot of unresolved relationship issues that, that need to be addressed 
maybe long before you could ever even talk about end of life planning. It's a very delicate, highly emotional subject and um, entering into the conversation can be very, very challenging. So Jessica, is that's, that's the end of the questions? That is the end of the questions that people were willing to submit this morning. But what I would like to put on offer is that they can be sent to me and I'll, I'll drop my address and I can continue to collate those and we'll add them continually to our resources tab on this, on that new website we're about to launch. That's okay. great. Just the closing thing, procrastination is the biggest enemy of state planning. Uh, we don't like to think about it, um, but uh, not having proper planning in place there's family disputes, assets getting into the wrong hands, court litigation, and, and money that just goes, that runs through your fingers. So essentially pick a time and get started. And to quote Ben Franklin, by failing to prepare, you prepare to fail. So don't be, don't be that guy. Don't be that gal. Uh, don't be that couple. Uh, go ahead and, uh, and, and get it done. I want to thank everybody for sticking with us this morning. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to see so many of you have, have uh, come in and logged into this. Uh, we definitely uh, hope that you're going to take some steps necessary to protect those that you love. Uh, very important. And then finally, our wish is that the God of hope will fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not, not just a human thing. We have a God that loves us and he can teach us and encourage us along the way. Um, so to close, Tim, if you're, uh, if you're willing, would you please uh, close us in prayer? Certainly. Father God, we thank you for this time together. And I pray that you would just grant us the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that we would live a life worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing you and growing in the knowledge of God and growing in the knowledge of what it means to be faithful stewards of all you have given us, that you would help us love our loved ones so well that we are taking care of them even when we're gone. What a great legacy that truly is. Amen.